Hello everyone, my name is Bedram and I'm a professor in data analytics. Welcome to another episode of Deep Learning. Okay, this is module number six, Deep Sequence Modeling, part two. All right, in part one, we started with a very basic model, right? We said that what is a recurrent neural network? What are the advantages? What are the limitations? How this network is learning the parameters by doing back propagation through time and things like that. So please make sure you watch that video before coming to this part, because in this video, we're going to talk about LSTM, which is an extension of the RNN. And I assume that you already are familiar or you have already watched my video for part one. Okay, here you go, part two, deep sequence modeling, gated cells, and specifically LSTM architecture. Okay, here's a quick recap of what we did in part one. So basically the, the advantages and limitations of RNN. So RNN can handle the following sequence modeling criteria, namely it can preserve the order in the time series or sequence data. It can handle variable input length. It can share parameters across the sequences. So these are all the good things about the RNN, which is advantages over, let's say, a simple neural network or even a convolutional neural network. And the limitations, however, are these two. Basically, the, the biggest one is that the RNN is, does not account for long-term dependency. And the reason is that it only remembers short-term history by looking at the previous state, right? So that was one thing. Another thing is that these state variables are depending on each other. So from time zero to time capital letter T, the terminal T, uh, these uh, S, we use this variable S, they depend on each other. So for example, if you're taking gradient of, we're at a state, uh, let's say 10, and if you want to take gradient at S10 uh, with respect to weights, you have to go away, go back all the way to the, to the weight, uh, to the state zero, right? So we did something like this. Um, Rhone S10, Rhone S9, multiply Rhone S9, Rhone S8, and etc. right? We went all the way back to the uh, to the S0 with respect to W. So this was a problem that we were multiplying lots of these gradients uh, where we used the activation function 10H and then the gradient was less than 1. If you multiply a lot, lots of um, these small numbers, uh, the, the gradient is basically vanishing, right? So these, this was another problem with the RNN. In this video, we're going to fix these things by introducing um, gated cells. Let's see how we can solve the vanishing gradient problem in general. I mean, any kind of deep learning models, including deep neural networks, you know, convolutional neural networks, or even recurrent neural networks. So the idea is that these solutions that I'm going to walk you through in the next couple of slides are going to be, can be applied to any kind of deep learning model. The first one is basically use different activation function, right? So we're going to use activation function that prevents fast shrinkage of gradients. So we know that, for example, this is our standard sigmoid or logistic. Then this is our tangent. This is ReLU and leaky ReLU. If you look at the gradients, so these are the gradients. For sigmoid and tanh, the gradient, of course, is going to be always less than 1. And we can simply change it, right? So in order to avoid these small gradients at the uh, both ends, we're going to use ReLU. And for the ReLU, gradient is always either 1 or zero. So this means that if we need to multiply so many of these numbers into each other, it's going to be, so the, the gradient is just simply one or zero. So it's not going to vanishing. So it comes with a caveat that maybe some of those um, nodes that we are having in a network is going to be underrepresented, but it's no, it's not a big deal because in practice, if the network is deep enough, the ReLU activation function is going to work just fine. And again, I want to emphasize that these solutions are, can be applied to any kind of deep learning models, not a specifically RNN. The reason that we're focusing on RNN here is that uh, the problem of gradient and the vanishing gradient problem is, is, is bigger uh, in recurrent neural networks because simply if the input sequence length is long, you have to multiply so many of these gradients into each other. So that was solution number one, change the activation function. The second solution is just simply change the weight initialization scheme, right? We can have different uh, ways of initializing the weights. And by doing that, we can ensure that those weights are not too small to begin with. So that, that's another thing. Uh, the third method, the third solution is basically using the concept of gradient clipping. And as the name suggests, it's going to limit the magnitude of the gradients from becoming either too small or too large. So remember, we, the gradient can become too small. This is the vanishing gradient problem, or it can get too large. This is the exploding gradient problem. In either way, we can clip those gradients and uh, 
uh, truncate the magnitude to make sure that uh, they are not going to either explode or vanish. The fourth solution is basically using batch normalization and applying to the output layer, uh, to the output of each layer, right? So this means that we are going to normalize the input to the next layer and helps to reduce the range of activation values, right? Remember, we were having difficulties at the very uh, left or right side of the activation values, right? So if we can bring them, if we can center them uh, by doing some normalization, then hopefully it can help uh, to, to basically change the uh, solve the vanishing gradient problem okay and that was a uh, fourth solution the fifth one is using a different optimization algorithm right so this uh, we are going to use an algorithm which is more resilient uh, to vanishing gradients uh, and these algorithms are for example atom or rms prop are the two that can handle those kind of things and just remember these five solutions that we are looking at right now for uh, solving the vanishing gradient problem they can be applied again in any kind of uh, deep learning model like deep neural networks convolutional neural networks or rnn so rnn can also do that but when it comes to sequence modeling this specifically when you're focusing on rnn and uh, the problem of gradient descent the vanishing gradient is is bigger right so we have to do it more efficiently there should be another more efficient way to handle that, which RNN cannot, right? So, and that's the idea of using gated cells, right? So this is basically what we're gonna cover. We're gonna use some sort of skip connection, and this is a key term. What we're doing here, we're gonna use some sort of skip connection, and these connections are gonna allow gradients to bypass some of the layers in between, and thus prevent the uh, prevent those gradients from becoming too small. So this is this should have ring a bell, you know, for you because we have seen something like this before. And when we talked about the ResNet architecture, when we are dealing with residual uh, connections, this is pretty much analogous to that idea. We want to come up with this skip connections that bypass the information, right? So bypass some of the layers in between, and then we are we need we don't uh, need to be worried about the vanishing gradient problem. All right, let's see what is inside these gated cells and what do we mean by a gated cell. So a gated cell, basically the idea is that instead of using a simple RNN cell, let's use something more complex with some gates which can control the flow of information. And by gates, I mean some mathematical operation that can force the output to be between 0, 1 or sometimes force it to be exactly equal to 0, right? So the whole point is that we can control the flow of information throughout the sequence. And uh, I think a good analogy is you can think of this as a conveyor belt, which is running parallel to the sequence being processed, right? Information can jump on and they can be processed and transposed to later time steps, and then they can jump off whenever it's needed. So this way, when we are doing back propagation through time, we are going to go back through this conveyor belt without being worried that the gradient in between is going to be diminished by doing lots of multiplications. So that's the whole point of using this conveyor belt running in parallel to our sequence being processed. Okay, so this is what a gated cell does. It is analogous to residual connections as we saw before um, in ResNet neural network. Okay, so LSTM, long short-term memory, and GRU, gated recurrent units, these are two examples of gated cells that can keep track of information throughout many time steps. So that's the whole point, right? So you want to make sure that uh, there is this conveyor belt running in parallel that can transfer information from one time step to another time step, and when it's needed, the, the, the information can be just uh, dumped, right? All right, let's start by LSTM at a very high level, right? So we want to compare the simple RNN recurrent cell with our more sophisticated gated cell, right, LSTM. Okay, so here at the top, what are the inputs of a simple RNN? We have basically our Xs, and let's say this is XT, and we have, you know, short-term memory, which is coming from previous state, right? And we are outputting... If it is, for example, many to many, we are outputting something yt, and at the same time, we are sending some information to the next, uh, to the uh, basically next time step, right? So this is, and and then of course there is just summation and activation in the middle, right? So that's a simple RNN. However, for the gated cell, uh, for uh, LSTM cell, we are going to specifically talk about three gates, right? The forget gate, the input gate, and the output gate, right?
So um, the inputs are pretty much the same, right? And if you look at that, the input of this LSTM, we're going to input you know, XT. And then, of course, some uh, short-term memory from previous state, and you know, we showed it ST minus one, or again, as I said earlier in the previous lecture, some people show it with HT minus one. That's just a matter of notation. And the idea is that this is the um, state coming from the previous uh, uh, previous time step, right? And now the new thing is that we have this thing called long-term memory. So this red line, this is our conveyor belt, right? That you were talking about in the previous slide. So we call it the carry track. So that's C stands for the carry track. And we are passing information untouched from one time steps to another time steps or whenever we want it, right? And so when I say untouched, it's not uh, completely untouched. We're going to say that let's forget some information and then add some information, some useful information to that. So this is what I mean by that. So it is less manipulated compared to uh, the regular simple RNN, right? So uh, these are uh, CT minus one, and we're going to get output one CT out, uh, uh, out of this state, right? So what do we have? These, these three gates, the forget gates. In the first one, we are going to forget irrelevant information from previous states, right? So literally we're gonna shut off information to be passed to this carry track. So this is this is the first gate. The second gate, we are gonna input relevant information. So we're gonna add some relevant information and selectively update cell state, right? So because remember guys, at the end of the day, this whole uh, sequence modeling is about this um, cell state, right? The information passing through the network from the previous time steps, right? And we are gonna sometimes forget it, sometimes uh, update it selectively, and finally we're gonna output this. So this is our output gate. So the output the output gate is gonna output the filtered version of the cell state, right? So this is this filtered version has a notion of both short-term memory and long-term memory. So the, the, the cool thing is that with this notion of long-term memory, now we can, for example, um, retrieve information from far, uh, far behind in, in time steps. Now let's talk a little more about the details of this LSTM cell. Okay, so here's a more detailed representation of the LSTM cell, right? So what do we have? So uh, let's start, let me use my blue one. So this at the top, this is, you can think of it as a long-term memory. This is a long-term memory. At the bottom, we have our short-term memory. And we call this one, the long-term memory, we call it cell state. And of course, it's coming from the previous uh, time step, right? And then it goes to the next time step. And the short-term memory, we can think of it as a hidden state. Again, it's coming from the previous state. We can show it with HT minus one or ST minus one, it really doesn't matter. And of course, we're gonna output this to the next time step as well. So this is a long-term versus short-term. So that's the first thing. Then inside this cell, we have uh, three gates, right? We have forget gate, we have input gate, and we have output gate, right? So in the forget gate, and as you can see, you know, schematically, we are using an activation function. We are using this sigmoid activation function, and basically it allows us to, to pass any information to, to the, let's say, the, to our cell state or not. This is, this is the carry vector, if you remember, right? So we want to, it can say, okay, it can be either zero or one or something in between. So it, it can say, you know what? do not pass anything to the carry state to the cell state or pass the entire or keep all the information and pass it to the to the long-term memory right so this is this is the job of forget gate right and remember each of these gates have their own weights so for example forget gates has its own weights and bias terms the input gate has its own weights and the bias terms and the same, the output gate has its own weight and its bias term. So the, the, the reason that I'm highlighting these things is because I'm going to show you the model summary in a couple of slides, and then I'll, uh, I want you to be able to calculate the number of parameters uh, of an LSTM layer, and we're going to do it together. So just remember, each of these gates have their own weights and bias terms. Now, the second gate is our input gate, right? So the input gate basically determines if any information should be added to the cell state, right? So it's going to do some operation. We're going to, we can look at the mathematics behind it, but that's, that's not a point. Uh, but at the end of the day, we decide what should be added to this, um, uh, added and updated to this uh, carry vector, right? And then finally, the output gate, this red one here, 
basically uh, this is going to form uh, the hidden representation the ss right that can be used to predict the output as well as what information should be passed to the next cell right so basically this this output cell is responsible for determining what is our sft right so we can pass it as a short-term memory to the next time steps or, or we can output it if it is a many-to-many -many, uh, model right and then of course uh, this thing is going to get repeated over every single time steps so uh, just uh, don't worry about the mathematics behind it if you learn these things at a very high level you know that there are these gates you're in good shape i guess and uh, the reason that i want you to um, let's say don't be too much worried about it because at the end of the day this network is going to be trained end to end all these weights are going to uh, basically be updated simultaneously and you cannot give credit to for example this is you cannot interpret them uh, per se for example forget gate is, is exactly doing this you know input gate is exactly doing this or etc but mathematically speaking we can uh, this doesn't mean that we cannot decompose them uh, mathematically right so for example for the forget gate let me write one of them for you so for example for the forget gates what we're doing what are the inputs of the forget gates you know we know that at the end of the day we are doing some summation and applying activation just any other uh, recurrent cell that you have been uh, dealing so far right so we have this weights uh, for the forget for the forget gates and then we are applying this activation to what are the inputs the inputs can be ht minus one again we show it with st minus one and basically we are inputting xt as well and we just need to add the bias term right so this is our forget gate we can do the same stuff for the yeah, for the input gate and then finally for the output gate so the activations functions are for example different uh, in the output gate we are doing sigmoid and then 10h and uh, in the input gate we are also doing sigmoid 10h and in forget gate we're only doing sigmoid all right okay so what else can we say so for example what are these pluses and multiplications here so let me actually write it down. This is our F of D, the forget gate. So as you can see, there is this mu multiplication sign. Uh, remember, at the end of the day, we want to update this uh, carry vector, right? The, the cell state. And we say the cell state in this time step is equal to, let's, let's bring some inputs from the forget gate. Let's go ahead and forget something this is a multiplication from the previous carry vector, right? So this is the first part. And now we're going to, uh, we're going to add, so here's the add part. So we're going to add something from the input gate. So let's see what is that something. So in the input gate, we can actually, here we are, we have two layers, right? One is a sigmoid layer. We can show it with I. Again, these are some notations. Don't worry about the letters. Just understand the concepts at a very high level. And we have some candidate values to be added to the care. So we show it with C tilde, right? So this is I T, C tilde T. And uh, writing down um, the equation for IT and CTLT is pretty straightforward, just like any other cell that we have had so far. So, for example, this IT is going to be an activation applied to basically it has its own weight, as we talked about, right? It has its own weight. And of course, you can, uh, the inputs are HD minus one here. Look at that. This is our HD minus one. And of course, we are inputting some XT and we are going to add its own bias terms, right? So this is our, um, this is the sigmoid layer. Basically, we're going to decide what values to update. And this C tilde is our new candidate. So these are new candidates that we're going to add to the carry layers, right? And again, this here, we are going to use 10H. So 10H. Uh, activation function. And as you can see, it has, oh, it, it, it's ha it has its own weight and which is we're going to multiply it by you know previous hidden state and of course the, the another input is x the in xt adding its own bias terms you know b c and that's it right and then we're going to um, combine this information by a multiplication basically we're going to say that okay let's go ahead and update this carrier state but standardize it by this uh, it right Basically, you want to say that, uh, something like this: that this um, uh, that all that we are going to add some new candidate values, but they are going to be scaled by how much we decide to update them, right? So this is going to tell us how much we are going to update them. So again, this is going to be your CT. So now this is uh, we, are, we are updating the carry the carry value, right? The carry state or cell state. So uh, 
forget something from before and then now let me actually use my highlighter forget something and now let's go ahead and um, add some new information and update the entire thing right so this is the update part and then finally we're going to do the output gate again this output gate has its own uh, two layers you know sigmoid layer let me use the red pencil it's had its sigmoid layer we can let me use red we can call it o o t and then basically we are going to go ahead and output some h of t right so this h of t so this h of t is a combination of basically two things whatever we output it here and this this is our sigmoid layer so this is we're we are applying the sigmoid activation function this sigmoid layer is going to decide what part of the short-term memory uh, should be outputted right and then another part is basically coming from this ct remember this is your ct and then we're going to apply a 10 h to that make sure that that ct is between 0 1 so ct so this is our output so this is what we're going to output right then and, uh, and as we said earlier so again we, we saw it we show it with s of t here in this in this visualization uh, this is basically what we're going to pass to the next cell at the same time we are keeping track of two things right these s of t's and this ct all right the short term and the long term memory i i know it was a lot and uh, but as i said earlier don't worry don't worry about the mathematics at all so the important thing is that to remember the lstm takeaways that we're going to discuss in the next slide so what are the LSTM takeaways? So remember, LSTM use gates to regulate the information flow, you know, input gates, forget gates, and output gates. This allows past information to be rejected, to re-inject it later, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that this new cell that we call it carry vector, right? That this is the cell state. This can better capture longer term dependencies, right? And by longer term dependencies, we don't mean thousands of time steps, right? So maybe LSTM can handle 100 time steps or I don't know, 200 at most. But beyond that, it's going to have problems. So we have to go, we have to change the architecture. So that's why in the next module, we're going to talk about, for example, transformer architecture, which is going to handle this long, long term dependencies better than LSTM. And then finally, uh, the LSTM fights the vanishing gradient problem by uh, the mathematics is a little more involved, but at a, in a nutshell, it's doing like this. It's going to when it's doing the, the back propagation through time, this path is going to be uninterrupted, right? So we're going to have uninterrupted you know, gradient flow, and uh, which works like this. When we back propagate, for example, this long term memory, CT to CT minus 1 and CT minus 2 and etc., we are dealing with some element wise multiplications instead of matrix multiplications. That's one thing. The other thing is that the short term memory, the ST, when we are back propagating, it's going to be a bunch of summations instead of multiplications. So, again, this is at a very high level uh, what's happening when we are doing back propagation. But as I said, don't worry about the details of the mathematics, just understand it at a very high level. We're going to apply it. Uh, using TensorFlow and see how it's handled uh, our temperature forecasting example compared to a simple RNN. All right, now that we know what is LSTM, let's apply to our temperature example. So for those of you who are watching this video without watching the previous part, we were working on a simple um, time series example, basically predicting what is the temperature in the next 24 hours from now having the past five days of information, hourly data, right? So basically, this is the setup. Just to remind you, the input shape is something like this. So we have the five days of information, hourly um, data. So five multiply 24, 120. This is a length sequence or sequence length. And we have 14 features. So this is our input, right? So the input is going to be uh, basically the batches which was 256 and then 120 is the time steps and 14 uh, features now we're going to add this lstm layer with 16 cells right or 16 nodes so we're going to combine 16 of these uh, of these lstm cells on top of each other right in the, in our first uh, lstm layer of course we can stack a bunch of these layers on top of each other but let's keep it simple let's do one lstm layer with 16 nodes right and of course we're going we're to pass it to a dense layer uh, with one node this with activation function linear because this is a linear regression uh, time series regression right uh, there we go and here is our lstm layer one lstm layer with 1984 parameters so let's actually talk about this number where we can get it 
remember in a simple RNN cell we had two uh, in, in any recurrent cell we had two sets of weights that needs to be updated one was related to the input and the other one was related to this uh, this state right now in LSTM we have the same concepts we have the same set of weights but for different gates right so for example we have no let's see first of all just remember the input uh, the, the shape of these input weights are going to be we have 14 features are going to be 14 by 16 because uh, remember we are going let me actually draw something and hopefully it makes more sense this is your input this is your cell this is your output right so we are talking about this weight and then there is this weight here uh, we go from uh, 14 features and pass it to the 16 nodes because we are going to have 16 of those uh, cells so this is the shape of each weight now we have four of these ones because remember we have input gate forget gate update gate and the, the the other one right so basically we have four of them one two three four oh sorry this was the this was the state let's do we're talking about the weight the inputs one two three four so we have four of these ones these are the w's we have four of u's you know the carry states parameter and uh, they are 16 by 16 because uh, we have 16 nodes and we are using if you're passing it to the next time step so it's going to be 16 by 16 by 4 and then finally we are going to add the bias term so the bias terms remember we had the output is going to be 60 we're going to output 16 of these things so and we have for each uh, gate we're going to use one so if you do the math if you add these numbers you should it should add up to 1984 so again for those of you who are curious where is this number of parameters is coming from that's how we do it basically of course it's going to be more parameters compared to, compared to a simple rnn uh, but at the end of the day it, it's not a big deal you know if you don't recall how these number of parameters are calculated but if you're curious here you go, yeah, now you know. All right, now let's look at the performance of this simple LSTM model. Okay, so LSTM performance, it seems that, uh, remember our baseline test MSE from the previous lecture was 2.62, right? And this was our naive forecaster. So the naive forecaster gave us 2.62, basically that model was off by 2.62 Celsius, uh, Celsius degrees um, and in a test set. Our simple LSTM, basically mean absolute error, is 2.53. So finally, we are able to output this uh, this naive forecaster. Because remember, we started with a naive forecaster, then we looked at a deep neural network, basically very simple neural network. It was not performing better. Then we added CNN. The CNN was not doing any better. Now we do RNN and LSTM, and finally, LSTM is outputting that benchmark which is great news okay so uh, but what's the problem you see we are overfitting right because it seems that right from the first epochs the training and uh, the validation mean absolute error is something around i don't know 2.5 and it stays there and that's basically a sign that we are overfitting right from the first iteration so how can we handle how can we attack this overfitting thing and the question is can we do better and up the answer is obviously yes let's see some of those best practices when it's come to uh, deep sequence modeling applied to time series okay so can we do better can we improve our simple lstm model let's see what are the solutions so we can improve the performance of the simple lstm by doing the following the first solution is by doing recurrent dropout right so the, this helps the, the model to just avoid overfitting because remember in our previous example it's it seems that using LSTM LSTM layer uh, outfit um, overfit the data right from the first iterations right so we are going to add recurrent dropout so this is something in addition to the ordinary dropout that we apply to the dense layers basically we are going to use dropout to fight overfitting in the recurrent layer right but the concept is the same the second approach is stacking recurrent layer we can so for example we can make sure that the model is complex enough to basically reduce uh, the bias the model bias right we can stack a bunch of these lstms on top of each other right it increased the model complexity to boost representation power at the end of the day we want to figure out okay what are these features 
that can represent the data better. And then finally, we can use something called bidirectional RNN. And as the name suggests, it's in, we are going to apply RNN in two directions, right? Basically, we're going to process the same information, the same time series, the same sequence of words, vocabularies, and etc. differently, right? So uh, it is mostly applicable to NLP because, for example, in this data set that you're dealing with temperature, it doesn't make that much sense uh, that we look at the data in reverse. Or, for example, for stock price, it doesn't make that much sense to look at the stock price in reverse. But for natural language processing, when we're dealing with text data, it makes sense, right? It, it, it sometimes, uh, we talked about it before, that uh, shuffling the text data some, uh, sometimes doesn't matter, okay? And that's, some, uh, we're going to figure out some new representation in the data if you look at the sequence of a text differently. So that's the idea of using bidirectional RNN. All right, now let's see how these solutions are going to work in practice. So the first one, recurrent dropout. Remember, one important thing about recurrent dropout is that it's different from ordinary dropout, and it means in a way that we have to apply the same dropout pattern at every time step. Because if you don't do that, it doesn't make sense, right? Because imagine we, we want to make sure that at each time step, we are keeping track of the same dropout pattern. So in order to make sure that it does not... Uh, randomly switch on and off with different patterns during different time steps. So th this is important and it should be applied to time series or sequence data in general. Uh, having that in mind, let's see how we can apply it in TensorFlow, right? So again, the input chain is pretty much the same. We're adding this LSTM. Now we have the luxury to increase the number of nodes in LSTM because we don't need to rely on the network size for regularization, right? So then we are going to say, okay, let's use a recurrent dropout of 0.25, and we can add an ordinary dropout um, here, and then we can add on top of it in the dense layer, and then finally uh, create the model. So, uh, in terms of performance, uh, the baseline test MAE was 2.62. This is our naive forecaster. The simple LSTM was 2.53. The LSTM with dropout, it's even better. The test MAE is 2.45. So, so far, this is the winner. If you compare this um, EPOC versus MAE and compare it with the LSTM, in LSTM, we were overfitting right away. Here, it is better. Well, probably we are not overfitting that much. But the problem is that, here's the problem, the, the validation MAE is smaller than the train MAE. So this is a strong signal that your model is not complex enough. So we have to make it more complex. How can we make it more complex? We are going to add, we are going to stack a bunch of these LSTM layers on top of each other. Okay, let's stack a bunch of those recurrent layers to make the model more complex, to make sure that the, the validation performance is not better than the train performance, right? Uh, okay, so we can do that, and actually, I'm following again. I'm following the uh, the notebooks from Deep Learning with Python, uh, Francois Cholet. So here he uses GRU instead of LSTM, and GRU basically is another gated cell approach. It's a slightly simpler version of the LSTM, and of, uh, obviously, it's going to be faster architecture. So let's go ahead and do that, and um, the input layer again, pretty much the same thing. Now we're going to stack a bunch of these. GRUs with 32 nodes, and you're going to apply recurrent dropout to both of these layers, and then uh, we're going to apply an ordinary dropout and then output the uh, and create a dense layer and generate the output, right? So, one thing that you should pay attention is that let me actually highlight it like this if you are using multiple LSTM layers stacked on top of each other or GRU layers on top of each other, you have to make sure that at each step, you're outputting the entire thing. Let me use my... So when I say ret return sequence is equal to true, it's gonna output everything. So this is these are my inputs. These are the, let's say, recurrent cells over time. And then we are outputting. We need to make sure that we are outputting everything. Let's say from Y1 to YT, whatever, Y hat T. Uh, this is important. Then we need to pass it to the next layer. So that's why that's why we have to make sure that even if you're doing many to one architecture, but if you're stacking multiple layers, the in-between layers, the return sequence must be true because we need those outputs for the next layer. All right.
So what is the performance? First of all, look at the look at the shape. So it seems that at some point the train, of course, MAE is less than validation. So this is a sign that okay, we finally got into a model that can overfit and uh, which is flexible enough. This is great news. And uh, now let's look at the performance. Uh, baseline, our baseline was 2.62, our simple LSTM was 2.53, and our stacked GRU, which is regulated, is 2.39. So this is the winner so far. Now let's look into bidirectional RNN applied to this uh, simple example. All right, so what is bidirectional RNN? A bidirectional RNN is basically, it processes the input sequence both chronologically and antichronologically. You can think of it from left to right or right to left, right? And it, it does it at the same time, right? So the idea is that maybe we can capture some patterns, some representation in the data that might be overlooked by a unidirectional RNN, right? So of course, this idea of chronological processing is important for a structured time series, right? For structured time series like stock price, like temperature, like demand, uh, or electricity consumption, things like that, we cannot think of antichronologically processing. It doesn't make any sense. However, for some text, no, the bidirectional RNN can be a great fit for that, right? Because let me actually show you how it's done. Imagine this is a text data, right? We can look at it chronologically, A through E, and then pass it to an RNN, or we can look at it in, in antichronologically E from A and then pass it to an RNN and we can concatenate the results, right? So that's that's basically the way that we do it. This this actually this is a great fit for uh, a text data or any other kind of data that the order matters, but which order you use doesn't really matter, right? In text you can go backward but and still you can understand the sentiment of the text. Right. So, however, for structured data, it, it, may, it might not make that much sense. So, for example, in the temperature example, the bidirectional LSTM is strongly underperforms even the common sense baseline, which was our you know, random walk with a drift. So, how we can construct it? We say input and input layer is pretty much the same. We're going to use this bidirectional layer from the CARES. So bidirectional, and we're going to use LSTM, each of LSTM 16 nodes, and that's it. Then we're going to pass, we're going to generate the um, dense layer for the output and then build the model. And that's pretty much it. Again, it in this example, it didn't work simply because looking at antichronolo uh, looking at the temperature data antichronologically doesn't make any sense. And if anything, it's going to make the model more complex unnecessarily. And all right, that was pretty much it. Just be aware, uh, this um, bidirectional LSTM, uh, where uh, back in 2016 or the years around 2016, it, they were considered the state of the art on many NLP tasks, right? And then afterward in 2018, 17 and 18, the, the idea of transformer architecture came in. And now as of today, they are the state of the art architecture for a natural language processing. All right, so what is the final message? So in this lecture video, we talked about LSTM. We said that why we should go beyond RNN. But just like any other deep learning model, keep in mind that this is more an art than science. There are too many moving parts, right? So for example, in LSTM, you have to decide how many nodes, how many units each recurrent layer uh, requires, right? Or you put 32, 64, what's that number? Number of stack layers, how many of these LSTMs or GRU or RNN you can stack on top of each other? Should you do bidirectional or unidirectional? Uh, what is the ratio for dropout or recurrent dropout? What are the number of dense layers that you can use? So what is the sequence horizon? So for example, in a temperature example, we use uh, five days, 24 hours, 140 observations. But why that number? Why not shorter or smaller horizons? Yeah, shorter or uh, longer horizons? What kind of optimizers to use? What kind of learning rates and etc. So as you can see, there are many, many, many moving parts here. And uh, there is no clear cut answer to that. There are some best practices, depending on different types of data sets, you can, for example, use those best practices. We covered some of them in the previous lecture videos, so make sure that you check them out. Um, but what I want you to take away, because usually when people talk about LSTM or later on, we're, we're gonna talk about transformers, they think that we can apply these kind of things to stock 
market and then make some money out of that. That's not the case. Just be aware that you can apply these models to the data sets that past is a good predictor of the future. This is completely contrary to a stock market because in the stock market, if anything, we know that past performance does not guarantee the future results. So that statement alone should tell you that there is no information arbitrage in the stock market. There is nothing out there left that has not been exploited by all these models extens extensively. So I think my message to you is that uh, learn these techniques and models and apply it to the data sets that I call them are more well behaved, not something like stock market price. All right. I hope you find it useful. And until the next one, take care.